Welcome back. I'm here with Mike Espesta from the History Department. Mike is working on safety education in the 20, 20th century in Britain. Mike's research is funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. So, tell me, you're looking at safety education. When and why did it start? It started just before the First World War in the workplace. There were a large number of uh, casualties, deaths and injuries, so something needed to be done. Um, and if we could start rolling the images. Yeah, we can uh, have a look. The idea about safety education is it's, it's really visual. So the photographs are quite important. They're really key right. to this. They're showing people exactly what to do or what not to do. Um, the idea is they're using friendly text, a kind of a friendly tone to talk to the people as if a conversation. Right. And how widespread was the safety education during this period? Uh, immensely. It spread out across society. So uh, particularly in the 1920s, road safety becomes a key issue. So we see here some cigarette cards issued that uh, give tips and hints on how to be safe out on the roads. And you can see they're, they're so quite ironic highly... they're stuffed into cigarette packs. Pack. Absolutely, <laughs> yes. And they're quite highly coloured as well. Yeah. So they're very attractive ideas, uh, images to try and really gain people's attention. Posters were really important throughout the period. So we've got an example here from <laughs> the 1960s and the workplace. Again, the use of colour, the, the attractive images to try and persuade people to be safe, which is the whole idea of education. Um, and it includes home safety leaflets as well, oh, so right. here, uh, what children should and shouldn't do in the house. And is that still around today? Absolutely. Uh, is, yeah. Plenty of accidents still today. Um, uh, think of the anti-drink driving adverts every Christmas. Yes, and uh, the health and safety executive recently issued this, which is a, a promise not for farmers. And they're supposed to hang it somewhere that's dangerous and it will remind them when they see it that they should be safe. Right, well, that's fascinating. And I see you've got something else there? Yes, uh, in the 1950s they used all sorts of things. So these are from the 1950s, uh, milk bottle tops, uh, but with road safety messages. There's all sorts of things that were used, even bars of soap. Gosh, that's crazy. Yes. Yeah. Well, that's really interesting. Thank you very much for coming along to talk to us today. Thank you. Now, on to something that is affecting all academics. Ranjing finds out more. Members of university and college union are taking strike action today to defend their right to a fair pension. The purpose of the strike today is threefold. Um, basically, we want to protect our jobs because the university is currently going through a restructuring where many people are having to reapply for their jobs and we know that there are not jobs for everybody. For decades, college and university staff have accepted pay levels that are lower than comparably skilled professions, partly because we had a pension scheme we were proud of. The teacher's pension scheme provides for a fair and decent retirement. Now, our right to a fair and dignified retirement is at risk from the government's proposed changes. I think it sent a very clear message that staff at the two universities in town and indeed in the College of Further Education are not going to see their pensions reduced. And I'm quite, I'm, I'm 61. I, I'm possibly in the category that this will not affect me. But I don't want younger colleagues seeing their pensions devalued. And I don't want to see my children taught by people who are so financially insecure that they can't commit to the job in the way that people, other generations have known university teachers to commit to. As part of its programme of cuts, the government is demanding cuts of up to £852 million from the teachers' pension scheme. The government wants us to pay more into our pensions, work longer, moving the retirement age up to 65. They also intend to measure the rise of our pensions by each year with a lower inflation rate. In addition, an inferior career average pension will take the place of the final salary scheme in the future, which means we will lose a large sum of money when we retire. The university and college uni members cannot stand by and watch our pension scheme destroyed. Well, there may be more industrial action. We'll see what happens. Um, obviously, we're a democratic body, and before we take industrial action, we have to go through um, a, a ballot of our membership to see if they're in agreement with it. We may be balloting again if we don't get any movement on the employers. But bear in mind, if you take what vice-chancellors as a whole have had over the last few years in terms of pay increases, 
and you see what we've had to be paid over that period, it bears no comparison and we want a bit of equal treatment for all. If, as the government says, and if the Vice Chancellor say we're all in this together, then let's all share the burden together. Hard working staff deserve a decent retirement, not to have their retirement targeted to swell the treasurer's coffers. Reported by Ran Jing, Brooks TV. In the first half, Shingo introduced us to a Chinese art exhibition at the Ashmolean, and now he's going to show us a Japanese exhibition at the Pitt Rivers Museum. The painting that you're seeing now is Sui Johnson exhibition, the exhibition that is currently held in the Pitt Rivers Museum. In her painting, she has currently combined the artifacts from the catalogue of Augustus Pitt Rivers. Although the exhibition only holds four paintings, it plays an important role in the recent project known as the Rethinking Pitt Rivers. I've asked Agent Brooks to find out more. When Pitt Rivers gave his collection to the university in 1884, uh, he didn't stop collecting. He continued doing that. Um, and he built up another vast collection, most of which is now uh, around the world. But there are catalogues, illustrated catalogues of that collection, which are now in Cambridge. And rethinking the Pitt Rivers is working with this catalogue of collections and bringing out the significance and the meaning behind them. So how does these paintings contribute to the project? What Sue Johnson has done here is to have taken the catalogues, which could be, which might have seemed like a shopping list of objects, and she has um, explored the beauty, uh, the painting, and the illustrations, and she's worked on those. So she's helping us to appreciate um, that second collection and the way that it's been catalogued. So do not miss this opportunity to pay this wonderful exhibition a visit. This is Shingo Nakajima for Brooks TV. Now, drivers, beware. You probably heard that the speed cameras were turned off at the end of last year. Well, they're back on. Michaelis reports. Speed cameras in Oxfordshire are operating again after they were turned off for the last eight months. Thames Valley Police took the decision to turn on cameras and resume operating mobile speed camera sites starting from the 1st of April. They were switched off on the 1st of August of 2010, after Oxfordshire County Council cut the road safety grant as a result to the government savings plan. But between August 2010 and January 2011, there were 982 people slightly injured, 179 people seriously injured, and 80 fatalities on Oxfordshire's roads. It's a sad fact that deaths rose 50% during the time that cameras were turned off. Thames Valley Police decided to find the speed cameras themselves. Is it a good tactic to reduce speed or is it just a way to generate revenues for the government? It's invasive. I think they should have more policemen on the street, not rely on cameras. Well, actually, it could be a good uh, thing to prevent strong and powerful accidents and to increase safety overall. I think probably on balance it's a good thing because uh, I think it does slow people down and I think there have been accidents. And the other purpose is that they are making a lot of money as well. Because it's money, they're trying to get tax. They try and fine as many people as possible and uh, keep all the money. What do the police think about the people's complaints for the speed coming? We generally get motorists that are caught speeding, will complain about it, but also when I've been standing here during the course of this, this morning I've had local residents thanking us for being back. So Let's hear how a speed camera works by Superintendent Rob Pope. Well, there's two different sorts. The, uh, the one in the mobile van behind us it uh, uses laser technology, so the operator will uh, press the laser to activate when they see a speeding vehicle, and it will tell you how fast they're going. And there's motion sensors that uh, are in the fixed sites, so they can tell between two spaces how fast the vehicle's going. So if it is going uh, in excess of the speed limit, it will flash, and it will take two photographs of the, uh, of the vehicle. The cameras are back. Let's see if they are as essential as they are supposed to be for the road safety. Michalis Chrysostomo, Brooks TV, Oxford. There is nothing better than a cool pint on a summer's day. Fred Cohen finds out about cheap beer in West Oxford. From the 14th to the 17th of April this year, 
the West End of Oxford will be welcoming you in the summer with the Spring Beer Festival. And today we'll be looking at the five venues who are hosting this event and seeing what the festival means to them. We're, uh, we're doing a, beer a Spring Beer Festival in collaboration with four other venues in the West End of the city. Uh, it's with the Honey Pot, the Jam Factory, Café Coco's, Co Coco Royale and the Retreat on Hyde Bridge Street. Well, actually, it's the first Spring Beer Festival we've done, but we did one back in October last year, which we called Oxtoberfest. See what I've done there? Again, in collaboration with the other venues, and we raised over a thousand pounds for Sobel House Hospice. So it was a really successful weekend, so that's why we're doing it again. The second beer festival offers you the opportunity to appreciate a large choice of beer and discover nice places in on the west side of Oxford. Between April the 14th and 17th, the terraces, the bar and the tables of these five venues are going to be full of beer amateurs. And now we find ourselves at the Jam Factory, which is one of the five venues hosting this event. This is the wristband. Now these wristbands are available at each location, costing you five pounds, but every pint after that costs two pound fifty. The festival group consists of five pubs who work together to bring life to the area. With this festival, the venues hope to bring a spirit of community to the west side of Oxford. The wristband symbolises the team spirit between the five venues. You hope to make the west side more attractive and pleasant. We work well together as a cooperative, if you like, rather than just individual businesses fighting against each other. We're working together, we've done something. The local area around here, we don't feel when we first arrived that there was a massive community spirit. It's very kind of disjointed. But since Oktoberfest, we've definitely noticed there's been quite a lot of other uh, regular customers that we've had because of the beer festival. And I think there is a, a good sense of community in this end of town as a result of it. Now all you have to do is turn up on the 14th and check it out for yourself. That's Fred Cowan, Brooks TV. And that's all for this year, but join us again in October for more episodes of Brooks TV. Yes, and don't forget, if you want to catch up on any previous episodes, check out the website btv.brooks.ac.uk. And make sure you sign up to the uh, Society at the Freshers' Fair. See you next year. Goodbye. Bye. Bye.